Uh, hello, my name is Dr. Julia Osman. I'm a French history professor at Mississippi State University, and I'm here giving a series of lectures today for the Society of the Cincinnati to help them make more information available for high school teachers. Um, and since high school teachers need to teach according to certain national standards, the Society of the Cincinnati has asked that I speak to certain of those standards. So my lectures on the American Revolution are not meant to present the complete American Revolution at all by any extent. I only talk about certain small parts of it. And my lecture on the Seven Years' War is not meant to be a complete complete history of the Seven Years' War, it just focuses on a few small parts of it. But what I'm trying to do is cover those, those particular standards um, to help high school teachers as they, as they have to pass them on to their students. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, right now anyway, is I'm going to be talking about Louis XVI. And where I left off in the American Revolution, we, uh, uh, the Americans and the French had just successfully fought the Battle of Yorktown. Thank you, France, and thank you to the French Navy, and thank you to French money, and thank you for French support, which made America seem like a legitimate, the United States seem like a very legitimate country. And I talked a little bit about what French help meant for the United States, the burgeoning United States, and I hinted a little bit at what at least fighting the Battle of Yorktown meant for the French and meant for the French army, which, which allowed really the French army to recover after uh, earlier embarrassing defeats at the Seven Years' War. Now they had a wonderful victory at Yorktown, uh, both with their army and with their navy. And so this lecture is going to be based on Louis XVI because people, when they think about Louis XVI, he's known for a couple of different things. Uh, he's known as the king who liberated America, and he is, he is listed that way on the national standards. Um, he is also known as the king who bankrupted his country, and he is known for being beheaded at the guillotine. Uh, poor Louis XVI. And so, but the interesting question here is how could Louis XVI who liberated America and who very much presented himself as a liberator and as a king of liberty, even though that might sound like a little bit of, a, of an irony or a misnomer to us, how could such a liberating king um, be the one who was beheaded at the French Revolution if he was trying so hard to create a, a, a context of liberty for the Americans and for his own people? And of course, the answer is it's very complicated. But the parts that I'm going to be focusing on uh, in, in this lecture is talking about how Louis XVI, by being a monarch of liberty, so to speak, really undermined his own authority to the extent where he couldn't, he, he wanted to ma remain king, but he had created a situation in which there could no longer be a king, which is, which is sadly the tragedy of Louis XVI. But I thought I would start with talking about Louis XVI in the context of kings. Because, of course, by the very fact that he is called Louis XVI, it gives you an idea that there were many Louis before him. And the, one, the Louis I'm going to start talking about is Louis XIV, who was his great, 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 great grandfather. And this is a lovely picture of Louis XIV. And you can see in this wonderful picture of Louis XIV that um, he is standing in a full suit of armor. He has a big, big black curly wig on with two little horns sticking out of his head. This was a, a wig that uh, people of the, of the highest classes would wear. He's holding... Um, uh, in his hand, a baton of the Maréchal de France. This was a, a military baton. It's, it's actually it's blue and it's covered with uh, fleur de lis, and it was given to uh, a man when he obtained the highest rank possible in the army. And so he's holding one of those, and it's resting on a uh, on a helmet, a military helmet. His hair is flying in the wind. His sash is flying in the wind. He's covered with sashes and medals. And in the background, a battle is raging. Now, it might be fun for students to look at various portraits of these kings and try to analyze the portraits because they're very interesting. And I picked this one because it showed Louis XIV as, a very war as very much the warrior king. And Louis XIV did fight many wars during his reign, and he fought these wars to bring glory to himself and therefore bring glory to France. And other images of Louis XIV often show him showing off his legs, um, which, was, which were very important. Um, it's kind of, kind of a symbol of, of, of the power, the foundation he was standing on. Um, and they also show him with various uh, uh, symbols of royalty, such as a crown or a scepter, uh, uh, things like that. And in the background, often, there will be ships sailing or there will be a battle fighting. And so this kind of presenting this image of Louis XIV as a very warrior king. And he, he did fight a lot of wars, and he was also probably the best absolute monarch that France ever saw. And while Louis XIV did not invent the concept of absolutism, um, he, he had inherited it from, from his forebears, but he perhaps perfected it. And so by absolutism, I mean that Louis XIV was in charge of everything, and everything came back to him. No one had power apart from him, and he was able to cultivate a certain personality and a certain presence um, that everybody would want to be attracted to him and be close to him. And so all power emanated from Louis XIV. And if an individual did have some power, it was only because Louis XIV allowed it or had given it to him. 
and he could show, uh, 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 Louis XIV would show favor in certain ways. Um, one of the more interesting things about Louis XIV, which shows his, uh, how he was able to um, uh, kind of keep everyone in his own uh, sphere of influence was his wake up, was his morning wake up ceremony. And when Louis XIV would wake up in the morning, um, all of the various nobles, only the most important nobles though, would be allowed in his chamber to help him get dressed in the morning, or to help him wash his face, or to help him put on his stockings. And the closer the, the garments were to the actual king's body, the higher rank you was if you got to hand them to him. So whoever got to hand the king his stockings was, was, was pretty uh, uh, well, well, well managed, whereas the man who got to hand the king his gloves, while still a very powerful figure because he got to be in the bedroom when the king woke up in the morning, wasn't as, as important as maybe the person who handed the king his first shirt. And so the idea that people would be very eager to serve the king by handing him pieces of clothing or by getting to serve him at his dinner table kind of, kind of is just an example of this wonderful sphere of influence that Louis XIV created. And he had the kind of powerful personality um, that, that could rule in this way. But because he also, had, he also perfected absolutism, the king is the sole person in power, he kind of created a system that would become very dependent on who that individual in power was. So if you could carry off absolutism like Louis XIV could, you would do pretty well as a monarch. But if you were not as strong as Louis XIV, you would not have as much success as a monarch. And this brings in the next Louis. This is Louis XV. Now, Louis XV was the great-grandson of Louis XIV. Louis XIV, who is not here, who is here. Louis XIV was um, a very long-lasting monarch. He lived for a very long time. He outlived his own son. He outlived his own grandson. So when Louis XIV finally died, he left the throne to a little five-year-old Louis XV, who is pictured here. And by the time Louis XV has his portrait painted, and there are also many portraits of Louis XV, um, styles had changed, times had changed a little bit. So he's going to look a little different from his great-grandfather. However, you can already tell that this is a different kind of person. Um, here he is, he's wearing uh, regular clothes, he's not wearing armor. He has some medals and some badges on him which indicate that he has seen battle and that he's in charge of an army. And Louis XV did have a warrior moment. I would not call him a warrior king, but he did have his warrior moment. Um, Louis XV was also known as the bien-aimé, the well-liked king. Although by the time he died, he wasn't as well liked as he had been in his youth. Um, and you can also see that in this portrait, you see lots of uh, beautiful fabrics around him. Um, and you see that he's, he's also holding on to um, uh, a baton for the Maréchal de France, the important, this important blue um, cudgel that had the fleur de lis on it that was always given to the highest ranking members of the French army. So he's still holding on to that. But there's no battle going on in the background. He's not wearing armor. Um, there's, you know, there's otherwise little indication that he's involved militarily. And it doesn't present the same striking image that Louis XIV did. And so this is another interesting uh, portrait to show perhaps the students and let them kind of analyze the portrait and see if they can divine from looking at the, the objects in the portrait what kind of King Louis XV was. Louis XV was not the monarch that Louis XIV was. And granted, it would be very hard to fill Louis XIV's shoes. Um, so we have to give Louis XV that. But Louis XV um, became more famous for his scandals at court than for um, anything that he did on the battlefield. And at one time, the, 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 biggest, the biggest scandal surrounded um, his taking as mistresses three sisters in succession of each other, which was very frowned upon, um, especially by the Catholic Church, because that was considered incest. And because Louis XV was very hesitant to give up any of his mistresses, although he, he gave them up twice, but he would always take them back. But because Louis XV was very hesitant to give up his mistresses, he was unable to take communion. And because Louis XV was unable to take communion and reconcile himself with God in accordance with Catholic tradition, um, he was not able to, to, to perform healings, which is something that French kings had been believed to be able to do. And it used to be custom that the French king would go out about you know, once a year, once every couple of years, and he would go about his kingdom and he would heal people with his touch, because that was apparently because the king was made king by God, and because he was king only because God had made this person king, um, he was able to perform certain healings. And Louis XV, because he would not give up his mistresses, he could not take communion, therefore he could not heal. And so some of those traditions that came along with the more spiritual side of the monarch and that showed off the monarch as more than just a simple man faded under the reign of Louis XV. Um, and then you move on to the portrait of Louis XVI. 
again, there are many portraits of Louis XVI, and I'll be showing some other portraits of him um, during the lecture as well, but this is the one that the Society of the Cincinnati has on display. Um, and of course, the Society of the Cincinnati is, is very enamored with Louis XVI because he did uh, help America so much, um, even though he did so mostly under the influence of Vergennes. But Louis XVI agreed with Vergennes and signed off on many of the things that, uh, many of the things the French did to help America. But you see, okay, that in this portrait, um, if you look at Louis XVI, you can tell from the background that this portrait's inside, or maybe it's on a balcony because you see a marble, um, a, a marble column here and kind of a balcony over here. There's nothing much going on in the background. Um, you can see maybe part of a statue of a ship, but there's no battle in the background. There aren't any ships in the background, which is different. He's obviously not wearing any armor like Louis XIV was. He also, he has one medallion right here, um, but he, other, he isn't covered with medals the way Louis XV was. So again, he's even farther, it, it, he looks even farther separated from the French army. He also does not have um, a baton, like Louis XV and Louis XIV did, and said he has a bit of a scepter here, and there, there's a crown in the background, and he's just holding a very pretty hat in his hand. So if you kind of look at the portraits and you kind of analyze the portraits of the king, you kind of see how we, the, the French monarchy went from Louis XIV, who was this very powerful, very dominating, very warrior-like absolute monarch, to Louis XVI, who is nothing like Louis XIV. Um, Louis XV is, is the, the, absolute, the absolute kingship is a little more watered down, and then you get to Louis XVI, and you see very little of Louis XIV, really, in Louis XVI. Um, Louis XVI was also, it also strikes, strikes me anyway from my research as being a very nice man, if not a very good king. Uh, and sometimes being a nice person and being a good ruler do not go hand in hand. Because while Louis XIV um, was, could be very repressive in his reign and while he could be very um, uh, a harsh in his retributions or harsh in some of his policies, he was able to keep the country very stable and, and France as a whole uh, 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 blossomed under Louis XIV in many ways. Whereas under Louis XVI, um, while he was a, a very nice individual, it seems like, the country did not exactly blossom under Louis XVI, though it went through some pretty important transformations. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. But kind of going along with Louis XVI, he, he was a nice man. He wasn't an overly dom dominating man. Uh, he liked uh, mechanical things. And one of his hobbies was to look at locks and keys and how they worked. And he liked engineering. He liked, those were very interesting to him. He liked to go hunting. That was a great deal of fun for him. But again, he, here he was kind of working in this absolutist system, but he didn't have the force of personality the way Louis XIV did to carry out that system. So he's already a little bit at a disadvantage here. However, he was a very much, he was very much a well-liked king. And he's, he, he is king during the Enlightenment. He is king during the American Revolution when ideas about different kinds of governments um, are being discussed. And because uh, France helped out uh, uh, America during the American Revolution, there were many publications that uh, were able to escape the French censors. Now, usually, if, if someone had tried during the reign of Louis XIV to publish something saying, hey, wouldn't be having a republic as a kind of government kind of a good idea? Those would never have escaped the censors and never have been published. But under Louis XVI, if someone printed something about America and said, isn't it nice that America is a republic? What a wonderful form of government a republic is. That would escape the censors because it was something that was lauding an ally of France. And there's a, some important work done on that by a, a woman named Joyce Appleby uh, several years ago, talk, talking about how the American Revolution affected what the French were able to read. And so, of course, during the Enlightenment, uh, during this time of the American Revolution, the French are reading all kinds of really interesting ideas. And Louis XVI wants to posit himself within those ideas as a king of liberty. So he is a king, he is a monarch, but he wants to show his people that he is a liberating monarch. And the American Revolution is a wonderful way for him to show that. And he's presented um, in, the, in, in publications and in press as a very liberating figure. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, this is one of my favorite sets of images ever. Um, these are both reliefs on the side of a, um, an obelisk, which is at uh, Port Vendre. And so these are, just, these are just kind of copies of those, of those um, reliefs. And the top one um, says, Servitude Abolished. And it shows Louis XVI standing um, at the, kind of at the back door of his fortress, and he is freeing uh, these serfs and granting them liberty. Now, by the 18th century in Western Europe, there weren't many serfs left. And a serf is, uh, is, is slightly um, worse off than a peasant, slightly better off than a slave. A serf is someone who is tied to the land. So a serf um, has to work the land that he was born on, and he cannot leave that land. Uh, and, and servitude, uh, serfs anyway, continued to, to uh, be very big and very important in Eastern Europe for a long time. But here, um, in this picture, it shows Louis XVI 
freeing his serfs. And all the serfs are kind of looking at him, supplicating to him, and they're holding up their hands to him. And Louis XVI from his steps is stepping down and putting his hand down to him, down to them as though it's like, I am the great monarch, I will liberate you serfs. And the serfs say, oh, please liberate us, thank you very much. That, there's a certain kind of body language there. In the second image right beneath it, it shows a big ship, a big French ship, uh, sailing in the water towards what looks like a giant stone fortress. And outside the stone fortress are people who look very much like the serfs. They have the same body language. They're kind of kneeled down. Their hands are pointed upwards. They're saying, oh, please, oh, please, free us. And of course, there is someone who looks very much like Louis XVI, but probably was not Louis XVI, um, standing on the ship with his arms stretched out to them like, oh, yes, I will liberate you. Except this one is entitled The Freedom of America, The Independence of America. And here it says, on the coast of the city of Boston, the people of America assemble on the riverbank, holding out their hands to the frigate of the king that is bringing them a treaty that ensures their independence. So it kind of you see a parallel here, that just as the king frees his own serfs, so he is freeing the Americans. And this presents Louis XVI as a liberating monarch. He's not a monarch who enslaves. He's not a monarch who dominates. He's a monarch who liberates. And it's a very nice image. And you see this, Im this image all over the place. And I'm going to show you another example of it, which I really like. Um, and it also shows kind of a more up-to-date uh, picture of Louis XVI. Um, is that there's this wonderful image right here. And this, this kind of image was everywhere. And this is, again, a very symbolic uh, image. And again, we see palm trees. Uh, I mentioned that there were palm trees in northern Canada in the Seven Years' War lecture, and that did not mean that the French actually thought there were palm trees in northern Canada. But the presence of the palm tree indicated that they were in, in, um, in the Americas. So here you see palm trees again, because palm trees mean America in, in symbolic language. Um, and so you see the palm trees, and this is an um, Amerindian figure, or at least a very romantic, very, um, very uh, sentimental portrayal of an, of an Amerindian person with a feather headdress on. And it's holding a staff, and on top of the staff is the Cap of Liberty, which is going to become a very important symbol during the French Revolution. And he's stepping on the head of a lion. And next to this, this Amerindian figure, uh, you see kind of a, a base with three statues on it, a globe of the world full of fleur-de-lis, and a rooster. Well, the rooster is the symbol of Paris. Obviously, there are, there, the, there's French symbolism in this beautiful blue ball. Um, and it's resting on top of Louis XVI, Franklin, and Washington. And the pedestal reads, uh, um, America and the seas, oh, Louis, um, we thank you for our liberty which is very nice. Um, and again, and, and of course, Louis XVI is on top of Franklin and Washington. So he's kind of getting primary credit for freeing America. And this Amerindian figure over here who's holding the cap of liberty and standing on the lion, this is a symbol used very often to show that here America is dominating England. But America is only able to dominate England because it's leaning on the help of the French. And so here, Louis XVI is again uh, garnering all kinds of credit for freeing America. And he's again being presented as a monarch of liberty, which is again lovely. And so you might think, well, if Louis XVI is a monarch of liberty, well, then what's the problem? Why would anyone have issues with Louis XVI? Since he doesn't seem interested in oppression, he's more interested in liberating people. And that's a wonderful question. But of course, Louis XVI wasn't just known as a monarch of liberty. He also was known as the monarch who bankrupted the state. And this, this is one, a very significant thing that uh, caused the French Revolution and that is directly related to the American Revolution. Because back when Vergen uh, was uh, hoping to, to aid the Americans and was kind of orchestrating uh, how the French was going to help America, either unofficially or officially, it was very clear to him and others that France could not afford to help America the way it wanted to. France, could, France had just come out of the Seven Years' War. It was in debt from the Seven Years' War. Um, and it did not have the funds to send so much money and so many guns and so many uniforms and so many troops and pay those troops and bring food for the Americans and everything else the way it wanted to. And yet, and yet the French provided that aid anyway. Now, on one hand, you could say, what better way to bankrupt your state than to help America? We're not complaining. Um, but on the other hand, you have to ask yourself, well, you know, again, what, what, are these, what are the consequences of this going to be? Um, and for Louis XVI, the consequences were dire. Vergen had hoped that by investing in the American Revolution and investing in freeing the American colonies, the American colonies, or now the, U the new United States, would be able to trade with France. And this would be wonderful for the French economy. And some of that did happen. 
but the French state still did not have enough money to support itself and went bankrupt. At this point, Louis XVI has to call together an assembly of notables to address the financial situation. Um, they are unable to find a solution, so Louis XVI has to call together the Estates General, which means that representatives from each of the three French estates who make up the French nation have to come together and discuss it. Uh, the third estate in France, which, doesn't, which only has one vote and thinks it should have more of a vote because it's the largest estate and represents the most people, creates itself in the National Assembly, and boom, you have revolution. And I just covered an incredibly complicated <laughs> story arc in about 30 seconds there, and I ask you to forgive me. But here we are in the French Revolution. And when the French Revolution began, and it officially began on July 14, 1789, with the fall of the Bastille, which was a prison and an arsenal in France, and the, the people taking it, which were mostly consisted of uh, members of the Third Estate who were day laborers, um, as well as members of um, uh, the army who had deserted their regiments. And this is another very, very long and complicated story that I am abridging very, very briefly, making very brief. When they took the Bastille, um, essentially what, it, what, what taking the Bastille meant is that people who are not in the, in the army and under uh, the direct authority of the king are now armed. Uh, and so, of course, Louis XVI wants to be on the right side of this revolution. Um, he wants to be on the... And, he wants to be on the right side of people who now have guns. And so Louis XVI is happy to go along with the idea of making great changes in French government. Uh, people who right, right now in the National Assembly are, are thinking of creating a government that's going to be like a constitutional monarchy, kind of like what is in England. Louis XVI says he's happy to go along with that. And so July 14th, the Bastille goes down. People are armed. And Louis XVI appoints Lafayette to be in charge of this new armed body. And in doing so, he creates the National Guard. And the National Guard is supposed to be a group of French citizens who are armed. And remember, they, they are still thinking of the uh, American militias and the American army as a group of citizens who are armed. So here we have the French version, uh, citizens who are armed and who are going to keep control and keep security in Paris. And the National Guard pops up all throughout France in different locations at about the same time. And Lafayette is in charge of the official one in, 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 in Paris. And of course, by putting Lafayette at the head, you can see that uh, the French government at this point is thinking of, of the National Guard as something similar to what uh, the Americans had in the American Revolution, which certainly helped the Americans a great deal. And, and of course, Lafayette is very much respected after the American Revolution. He's a great hero for France. Lafayette's very excited about changes happening in his own country. Um, in fact, when the Bastille goes down, and this is a cute story, when the Bastille goes down, um, Louis the, uh, Lafayette is able to get a key, an actual key, from the Bastille prison. And in 1790, he sends it to George Washington with a beautiful, beautiful letter. Lafayette could really write some beautiful prose. And he sent this, this, this key to George Washington, say, I present this key to the Bastille um, as a missionary of liberty to its patriarch, um, as a son to his father, as an odd de camp to his general. But he's, he's presenting it as a missionary of liberty to his patriarch. And so you can see that Lafayette's making the connection of, well, George Washington, you fought this wonderful revolution in your own country. I'm starting to fight one in mine. And so I, I present you with the key of our, of, of our fortress of depotism, as he called the Bastille, which we have just taken down. And it's beautiful, and it's wonderful, and it's lovely. And unfortunately, the sentiment doesn't really last. Um, and so I have here to show you um, this, this is really, really neat. Um, this is a wonderful kind of little medallion, um, and it presents a picture of Louis XVI. And, you know, this is again Louis XVI, and not his most impressive portrait. If you kind of prepare, compare this portrait to Louis XIV, you see how differently Louis XVI is kind of approaching his kingship. And then you have Lafayette on the other side, and the medallion commemorates Louis XVI, who is king of the French, and Lafayette, who is in charge of the guard. And at this point, the revolution is, is not looking too bad for Louis XVI. He's probably going to lose some power. He seems all, all right with that. At least he's putting up a good front. Um, Lafayette, who is a great noble, he, even though Lafayette is helping the French Revolution, he's still a great noble in France. He's coming from a very good family. He's proved himself in battle multiple times. He is a hero returning from America. He's together there with the king. And it looks this kind of medallion indicates that, look, together Lafayette and Louis XVI are going to lead the French nation to a new and glorious beginning. And it looks that way in 1789 to a lot of people, that this idea of having a constitutional monarchy is going to work as the National Assembly tries to put together a new constitution and as the king is agreeing to, uh, to, to sign the constitution and things like that. However, as I mentioned earlier, this, this kind of um, interesting propulsion is not going to last, and Louis XVI is kind of going to, to, to spell his own doom. Because while Louis XVI seems, loves to present himself as, as a king of liberty, um, his heart isn't always exactly in it. And before I continue, I want to mention one more thing, which is that Louis XVI is very responsible for the Society of the Cincinnati in France. 
Now, as the Society of the Cincinnati was formed um, right after the American Revolution uh, by uh, Henry Knox and, and some other American officers as a society that would um, perpetuate the ideals of the American Revolution, and it would be uh, a, a, an, an honor. The membership would be inherited by the eldest son of the original member, and his eldest son would would inherit it and so on and so forth and they would help each other's widows and they would help remember the American Revolution and get together on a regular basis to help commemorate the American Revolution um, and this sounds just lovely and part of it was going to be that they were going to wear a certain military decoration an eagle um, and and this would be great and of course there was because the French helped in the American Revolution there's a French branch of the Society of the Cincinnati and it still exists today but when it was first created in the 1780s, the French were so excited about this society because it, it's, it's right up their alley. They get a nice military decoration. It was open for anyone who had served a certain number of years in the American Revolution and had obtained the, ob obtained the rank of colonel or general, and it became the new must-have at court. And Louis XVI had to give a very special permission for society members to wear their little decoration, their eagle, since it was a foreign medal and not a medal of France. And Louis XVI was more than happy to grant permission. This is very popular. He was riding the popularity wave, and Louis XVI asked if he could join too. And of course, Louis XVI was not a colonel or a general in the, in the French army, and he did not spend any time at all in America. But of course, since he was the king who had provided uh, so many resources and provided the army, of course, of course, of course, you can join Louis XVI. So he had his eagle too, and was very happy. Uh, and so many nobles wanted to join the Society of the Cincinnati because it was a mark of such esteem that poor George Washington back in America, who was the society's first president, was inundated with mail from uh, French officers and from naval officers, because at first the Navy wasn't included, not because George Washington wanted to not include the Navy, just he wasn't thinking about it. So of course, then the Navy had to join, and all of these people are writing George Washington saying, I know I wasn't a colonel when I was in the French army and serving in America, but I got wounded twice at this battle and wounded once at this battle, and I became a colonel right afterwards because I was wounded at Yorktown. Can't I please, please, please be in the society? And George Washington would say, sure, sure, sure. Uh, and so the, because the Society of Cincinnati is perpetuating American revolutionary ideals through the 1780s, it's also kind of, again, laying the seeds for Louis' own destruction. And Louis loves the Society of the Cincinnati, but it's not the kind of thing that strikes me as something that Louis XIV would ever have supported, but Louis XVI, monarch of liberty, is very happy to support it. And as I mentioned earlier with this lovely medallion, um, in 1789 and 1790, beginning of 1790, it doesn't seem like this is, this, this is going to necess necessarily bring any harm to the monarch. And people are very excited about Louis XVI and are very excited to have a constitutional monarchy. And, and, and the French Revolution does not begin because anyone wants to get rid of the king. It begins because they do want a change in government, but they still want to keep their king. He's an important part, uh, he's, a, he's an important part of France. And Louis XVI has done many steps to kind of embrace uh, uh, something that is more uh, I hesitate to use the word democratic, but something that is a kind of government that's more inclusive, in which Louis XVI isn't the only one in power. However, however, Louis XVI is still coming from an absolutist system, and as much as he is okay with certain measures of the French Revolution, he doesn't want to stop being king entirely. He doesn't want to give all of his power over. And Louis XVI has always been has not been too hard to influence during his life. He was under the influence very much of Virgen um, when he was younger, and at this point he's very much under the influence of many of his nobles, who of course do not want to see um, French society rearranged in a way that gives them less power. Um, so Louis XVI does begin to make uh, uh, negotiations with Austria um, that would allow Austria to come into France and fight the revolutionaries and end the revolution and restore Louis XVI to all of his power, restore all the land and all the power to all the nobles um, who have had, had their power and their land decreased. Um, and and as, as pressure is mounting and as people are, are pushing Louis XVI to accept more and more radical revolutionary um, uh, uh, changes, uh, Louis XVI decides the safest thing for his family to do is to escape France. And so late one night, he and his wife, Marie Antoinette, and their three children um, get into a carriage uh, with a, a nursemaid and a servant, and they start to head for the Austrian border. And if they can make it to the Austrian border, which is where many French nobles are hiding at this moment, and which is also where his wife, Marie Antoinette, is from, then he knows he'll be, he'll be okay, he'll be protected. And from Austria, he can try to redirect a reversal of some of the revolutionary policies that he really didn't approve of um, when he was kind of forced or, or pressured um, to agree to. Of course, though, Louis XVI, being a nice guy but not always the brightest guy, leaves in a giant carriage that's very 
gilded and golden and beautiful. Uh, and is moving, very, moving really too slowly as he starts to go towards the Austrian border. And he almost gets there. He almost makes it. But in a small French town, just, just on the French side of the Austrian border, he is stopped. And that town is called Varennes. And so this episode of the king is usually called the flight to Varennes. And so Louis XVI is exiting his carriage. Um, he's often portrayed as, as being very hungry and needing a snack. And so he's stopping somewhere to get a snack. Um, really, he and the, the royal family needed to stop and rest um, for a little while. And so he's walking around. And, and legend has it that he went up to a man and said, hello, I need a snack. And he presented a coin that had his own face on it. Because of course, Louis XVI, monarch of France, is going to have his image on the currency. And the man looked at the coin, legend has it, and looks at Louis XVI and says, oh no, you are the king. What are you doing here? Um, but the, whether or not the, it involved the coin, the king was recognized. Louis XVI, even in his great disguise, was recognized as being the king. And of course, by this point, he had been missing in Paris. People had noticed he had left. And uh, some even blamed Lafayette for kidnapping him. Or for, uh, or, for taking, remove, or for removing the king. And Lafayette says, I really don't know where the king is. And they say, well, we have to find the king. So the king is stopped in Varennes. He is found. And so a big to-do is made about, oh, good, the king was kidnapped. Aren't we glad we found him before the kidnapper took him to Austria? Wouldn't that have been terrible? Well, let's make sure we all escort the king back to Paris where he belongs. And the king is kind of being like, I'm so glad you rescued me as he's seeing Austria get farther and farther and farther away. Uh, and of course, things aren't going to end well for Louis XVI when he gets back to France, because um, as much as I'm sure Louis XVI would have loved to perpetuate the myth that he had been kidnapped, they found papers that he had left in France saying, Dear Austria, I would love it if we could organize a counter-revolution together. Let's talk. I'll be in Austria in a little bit. Love, Louis. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he left documentation showing that he was indeed planning a counter-revolution uh, and was going to be in league with Austria. And, uh, Austria was not a, a favorite country of France at the moment. And so it really just, it really just uh, pretty much condemned Louis XVI as being someone who was very counter-revolutionary and therefore had to be removed. Now, the decision um, to execute Louis XVI was, a, was, again, a very complicated decision. And I'm not going to, to show all of it in its beautiful um, uh, uh, complications. Uh, but uh, Louis XVI was removed as a monarch, one, because he was seen now as an enemy of France. He was a traitor of France. And two, also because if France was going to succeed as a republic, it could not have the stain of monarchy on it anymore. This was, this was one, one school of thought. And several people did not want to execute Louis XVI. Many people did want to execute Louis XVI. And when it came to a vote, those who did want to execute Louis XVI edged out just a little bit. Now, of course, as the revolution becomes more radical and begins to do things like kill its own king, um, it becomes very unsafe for any, anybody who, doesn't think the, who thinks the revolution has become too radical, like our dear friend Lafayette. Lafayette was not uh, uh, supportive of the decision to, to execute the king by any stretch of the imagination. He was not at all uh, uh, in, in league with those who wanted to make the French Revolution more radical. Uh, Louis, uh, Lafayette would have been very happy to have a constitutional monarchy. Lafayette was very happy when the, American, when the French Revolution seemed to be borrowing some ideas from the American Revolution or seemed to be affected by the American Revolution. At this point, Lafayette doesn't recognize it anymore. And he knows that he is in danger because he uh, did not support certain radical measures of the French Revolution. And he decides to flee with his family as well. Unfortunately, before he can flee, he's actually arrested. But he is kept in Holland. And eventually, long story, ends up in an Austrian prison. And so poor Lafayette, who is the great hero of the American Revolution and whom we remember very fondly, spends, spends the vast majority of the French Revolution in an Austrian prison. Um, eventually, he's, he's set free, but he can't return to France yet because Napoleon Bonaparte, by this point, considers him a threat. This is in the late 1790s. And eventually, Lafayette sneaks back into France, much to the anger of Napoleon, but promises he will not challenge Napoleon and decides to retire as a private citizen in France. Um, and that is why when Lafayette returns to America in the 19th century to do kind of a grand tour for a period of about a year, he is so happy to be in America because he knows that in America he is still a great hero, whereas in his home country of France, his legacy has become much more complicated. The, the revolution doesn't want to claim him because he wasn't radical enough, and yet the nobles don't want to claim him because he still wanted to start the French Revolution in the first place. So poor Lafayette, um, in his own country during his lifetime, is kind of stuck in a, in a nebulous, uh, kind of a, a tense, difficult situation. And of course, Louis XVI uh, uh, ends up being beheaded. So what are we to make of all this? Um, well, I, I, I think it is interesting to look at how France and America have been intertwined in the 18th century. And you look at the, the Seven Years' War where France and America were, were, were right in each other's territory. Um, and yet the fact that the French were expelled from North America after the Seven Years' War didn't end the relationship at all. It just put it on hold for a little while until 
until American colonies were ready to rebel. And then of course you see a wonderful partnership between America and France during the American Revolution, um, which, which granted America a certain amount of liberty and granted France a certain amount of prestige for fighting in, this, for fighting in the American Revolution and for winning um, the Battle of Yorktown so, so wonderfully on the scene and on land. And then it's interesting to follow the, the, the trace, what kind, of, what kind of trace did the American Revolution leave on France? What kind of trace did America leave on France? And look at how when the French Revolution started, it seemed like, and for the, the first two years of the French Revolution are usually called the, the Liberal Revolution, um, in that it seemed like it was going to be moving in a direction towards something that would allow more representation for people in the government, but nothing, nothing too radical. However, by the death of Louis XVI and by the imprisonment of Lafayette, the French Revolution has really gone on its own terms. And uh, at that point uh, uh, for the 18th century, France and America start to go on their own paths.